Go ahead, sir, everybody. So uh, thanks for, for coming. There's not too much to say that's not on that slide. Uh, after James's talk, we'll open up to uh, a couple of lightning talks about some exciting Python things that are happening in Cardiff. So if you haven't heard about them already, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them at the end. But yes, let's, let's all wait, welcome James, who I'm hoping will actually explain blockchain to me finally today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm James. I'll quickly introduce who I am. Um, I did an undergrad degree at the School of Mathematics around the corner, and I'm still there. I've just started a PhD in deep learning. Um, happy to talk about that too, but not during this talk. Um, uh, how did I get into Bitcoin and blockchain? So I first heard about it in about 2014, and it was very much magical internet money. And I thought, okay, this is cool. Um, and bought like five pounds worth at what was then an all time high. Um, and immediately crashed, uh, literally within about two weeks of me buying that. And I, I forgot about it. I was like, okay, this is dead. Completely forgot about it. And then it all came back into the media around 2017. I thought, oh, I remember, I remember buying some of this. I went and had a look and whoa, now it's worth 20 pounds. So <laughs> best investment of my life, <laughs> percentage returns wise, but overall gains, not so impressive. Um, but since then I've got far more into the technology behind it and I've been completely hooked ever since. So I thought I, and I get a lot of questions about it and the general consensus is that people have a very uh, surface understanding of what's going on so I thought I'd do a real basics introduction to that so if anyone is a blockchain expert here I'm, I'm sorry please call me out if I make mistakes as well um, and I'm happy to take questions throughout the talk if I've not made something clear please just ask me that's not a problem at all okay so a little bit of history and background Bitcoin is the first blockchain. They are, you can't separate them. Um, you can't really have one without the other. Uh, but the blockchain is the technology, the underlying data structure that underpins Bitcoin. It was outlined by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym, back in October 2008. Um, so Bitcoin is the first example of a blockchain. Likewise, if someone had come along and just created the, the data structure of the blockchain, Bitcoin would have inevitably come after that. They're, they're inextricably linked. The network was then went online January 2009, and the first time Bitcoin was used to purchase real physical goods was May 2010, when a bloke spent 10,000 Bitcoin on two pizzas. Um, worth an obscene amount of money today. Interestingly, he just made the first physical purchase on something called the Lightning Network, which is a second layer scaling solution. Uh, again, he bought two pizzas just for nostalgia. The same, um, hi. The same person? Same person, for, <laughs> just for nostalgic purposes, he said, okay, there's this brand new bleeding edge technology on top of Bitcoin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy two pizzas That's again, cool. just, just to say that I did. Um, that, that headline from the Times, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So that was the headline in the Times on the 3rd of January 2009. And that headline was included in the block header of the very first block in Bitcoin. Um, they embedded that uh, header, which maybe gives some uh, insight as to the motivation for where Bitcoin has come from. Um, Okay, so a quick definition of a blockchain. A transparent, public, distributed, append-only ledger. That quote says it's unknown. That's because I've forgotten who said it. Um, <laughs> it's written down, it's written down in my notebook in quotation marks and circled and starred. So I've clearly seen it in a talk or read it somewhere, but didn't write down who or where I heard it, but um, I used a really good 
uh, definition. So I'll take it through step by step. What I mean by transparent. So no information is actually hidden in a vanilla blockchain. Um, so the idea that you can see everything that's going on, nothing is, um, nothing is private. Uh, public, what I mean by that, anyone can then use it and access it. There's no barriers. Um, if you've got an internet connection, you can interact with the blockchain. Distributed, so it's running on a global network. This is not just sitting on one server. This is a, a globally distributed network and append only. We can't edit the blockchain. We can only add to it. Okay, so what do we mean by a ledger? A really quick example of a very basic ledger. And I'm going to be using Bitcoin as an example of blockchain pretty much throughout the talk, just because it's a really, it's an easy example to get your head around the fact that we're sending money from one person to another. So simply a ledger, instead of uh, writing down the amount of money that everyone has and moving that around, we write down the transactions. So if Amy sends Ben 13 pounds, and Ben spends some money at Tesco, and then Amy works at Lidl, so they give her her paycheck. And from this, we can work out how much money anyone has. So we don't need to, we don't need to keep track of your actual balance, we're just keeping track of the transactions between participants. If everyone has a copy of this, and we all agree on this ledger, we don't need to use money. We can all just look at our copy of the ledger and say, okay, I can see that Amy was paid this much, spent this much, she must now have this much, so I can accept that payment from her. And then we say, okay, Amy just spent that money, and everyone updates their ledger globally. So the problem becomes, how do we make sure that we're all looking at the same ledger? It's a consensus problem. We all need to agree on the state of this ledger. <clears throat> okay, that's a very high level. That was how I explained it to my grandparents when they asked me what on earth I was up to. But we want to go, we want a little bit more detail, I reckon. Um, so, let's take a step away quickly. A hash function is any function that can be used to securely map data of arbitrary size to data of a fixed size. These are really important within blockchains, really, really important. Um, and they've got some cryptographic hash functions have some particularly useful properties. They're deterministic and fast. If I hash the same piece of data, I will get the same hash value out of that every single time. And they're really, really quick and simple to compute. They're non-invertible. The only way to replicate the original data from a hash value is brute force. There's no way to go from a hash value back to the original data. They're collision resistant. So the chances of me having two pieces of data that produce the same hash value is very, very small. And we have something called the avalanche effect, where, which is where a tiny change to the input data causes the output to be completely different. To the casual observer, they are completely unrelated. So let's have a look at an example. Some actual Python. OK. <coughs> Import hashlib. Please call me out on any typos, because there will inevitably be some dead quickly. So we're just going to hash um, the word pi, and we want uh, the hex for that. OK. So we get out this string of numbers and letters here, which is just a hexadecimal number. And as soon as we change this, even slightly, our value changes completely. And if I go back, that's the same value I had before. And that will always be the case. And then I'm quickly going to write a, a function just to hash some arbitrary data together. So I 
and then we create a SHA-256 object, and then we can add to these. So we'll just join all our data together. And everything has to be um, UTF-8, otherwise it falls over. And this is quite a naive function I'm writing. There's obviously limits on the data that this can take. So this, this blockchain I'm creating is a toy example. I'm in no way suggesting that this should be uh, <laughs> run in production. It's just to, it's more demonstrative, to show, just to show the core ideas. Uh, says we should use this instead of... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, and then we should now be able to just say, And we should be able to pass that pretty much anything we like. Lovely. And again, if we change any of this data, the hash function we get, the hash value for it changes. And there's no there's no way for us to get back from this hash value back to the original data that I put in. Completely impossible. Okay. So that's a hash. But we wanted to learn about blockchains. So maybe I should talk about those. We should start with a block before we talk about blockchains. So I'm going to really quickly say a block has four things. An index, so that we can identify an individual block. It has some data that at the moment we don't care about. We're just going to say it's, it's arbitrary data. Uh, a nonce, which is a number. For now, we don't care. It can be any number, we're just going to leave it there. And it needs to be hashable. We need to define a way that we take those things and hash them all together so that we get this unique hash for a block. Okay, so let's do that. Right. Class block. So I said I wanted it. Ooh. Index data. I don't know, perhaps for the back row genes, it's worth making that font a bit bigger? Yeah, absolutely, sorry. Is that better? It's better, yeah. Yeah, that's better. Oh, sorry. And then we said we wanted this nonce, and we don't care what that number is, so we're just going to set it to zero for now. And it needs to be hashable. So, and we will return. Fortunately, we have that function to uh, hash some arbitrary inputs. Self dot index. Lovely. Oh, and I'll uh, add RD just so when we print these out, they look okay. So I'll say this, we'll give it a block. And what do we want to see? We want to see the data <coughs> and okay that looks reasonable that looks like it should work so let's have a look example block equals let's create a block we'll give it an index and we'll give it some so that index is that like the Corresponding on some way to like are the first in, in uh, transaction. It will. It and will some, when, correspond when to the order that they're they're created. Okay. Um, but now it's just so we can yeah. identify them a bit easier. So then let's have a look at that example block. Cool. Oh, and let's also 
Let's include the. Uh, let's have a look at the hash. Fantastic. So we've created this block number one. We're giving it some silly data. We're leaving the nonce alone. We don't care about that now. And we're able to hash it. If I change this data, my hash changes. If I change the nonce, my hash changes. If I change my index, my hash changes. Any changes to this block is completely changing the hash value of the block. Now, you've probably heard of mining a block. You might have heard of mining Bitcoin miners. What does that mean? So we're now going to say, we're going to put a condition on blocks. They're not valid unless the hash satisfies a certain criteria. Um, and in Bitcoin and in this toy example I'm going to create, it's that the hash value has to be less than something, which is equivalent to it starting with a certain number of zeros. So we can write a, we can add a mining function to this block. So block isn't valid unless its hash value satisfies property uh, that it starts with a certain number of zeros. So let's get that. Wow. So we're going to say, just for this toy example, the first four uh, digits of that hash value have to be a zero. One, two, three, four. Otherwise, it'll take ages. And the only thing we can edit, the only thing that we don't really care about in our block, is the nonce. Clearly, we don't want to edit the data until the data, until it hashes down to something with four zeros. We don't want to edit the index. So we'll keep changing the nonce until our hash value starts with four zeros. Can I ask, why is it called nonce? Did you say that? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I can't remember, but it's a peculiar choice of words. It is. Um, but that's, okay. that's what they, that's not me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should look that up, actually. Question. I didn't know what it meant. It's a, weird, it's a really <laughs> weird word. Yeah, it's yeah, a really no, weird no, word. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, wouldn't have been my first choice. I don't know where that's where that's come from. So what we're doing here is we're hashing the block, seeing does the hash start with four zeros? No, it doesn't. Let's change the nonce. Hash it again until we get those four zeros, at which point we stop. Um, and we'll just print block mind. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that all ran. Fantastic, as we'd expect it to. But this is not a valid block. It doesn't start, the hash does not start with four zeros. So let's mine example block. And then we'll print it. <coughs> Shouldn't it be, um, is it self dot nonce? Because you want to actually change the. Yep. Thank you. Fantastic. So we got a nonce value of 9830. Nine and then our hash value started with those four zeros. If I went back and I change the data, we'd see that the original hash would change and then my nonce value would change as well. I'd have to redo that work. And that's the avalanche effect, isn't it? Yeah, any change is causing something completely different and there's no way for me to know what that nonce value should be in order to create a, a valid block. I have to go through 
brute force and try one value after another. So if I, so if I come along again and say, and change the data, uh, pydiff spelt wrong. Let's do that. Uh, print example block not valid and we have to go through and we have to mine again. So you may have heard this referred to as proof of work. It's I have to prove that I have done CPU work on my computer that this block is valid. Even though there's a chance that that CPU work would in fact only increase the nodes by one. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, and, it, and it is, it's, it's a lottery. Yeah. Um, so the and the difficulty is is adjusted depending on for Bitcoin the difficulty is adjusted so that blocks are mined at a regular rate. So we can change this in the network definitions. We can say okay, we're going to increase the number um, of zeros. The number of zeros that it has to. If suddenly there's a huge increase of CPU power available, we increase the number of zeros so that we get blocks being mined at a consistent rate, which for Bitcoin is once every 10 minutes and varies between... Consistent on, on average, because again, on with average, any, any again, given one. You might get one yeah. straight away. And it could be 20 minutes, it could be longer. And the only point of those four zeros is a purely, as you say, artificial proof that some work has gone in. That's, that's right. the only, okay. the only uh, reason for having them. So that explains why people used to start off with G CPUs and they had to start using GPUs and now that even that is not profitable anymore and they yes. want a specially designed specially hardware. designed hardware that is just really good at SHA-256 and when you how how so I've always understood blockchain to be the, the computers doing some hard mathematical problem so have you simplified things quite a lot or is that Nope. That is the hard mathematical problem. This is problem. the hard mathematical problem. Okay. Wow. So if someone breaks SHA-256, Sha the whole thing goes down, except it's fairly trivial to say within the network, okay, SHA-256 is broken, we're going to use a different hashing yeah. algorithm that isn't broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, this is exactly, this is exactly, this is exactly what they do. This is the, the hard maths problem that they solve. It yeah. can only be done by that brute force. force. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And is the reason why these chips are so much better for it, is it because the amount of parallel processing that they can do on is that? The ASIC chips, are what they are... So if it's just adding one? They are custom... Ah, so the just adding one is my way of brute increasing, of my, is my way of brute forcing. Oh, right. But there are many implementations of how do I actually go about go about this so for example if if me and Vince decided that we wanted to work together to mine a block it would be pointless as both starting at zero and increasing at one we'd better off all right I'll start at zero you I'll start, start 500. at 500,000 and we'll go and see so um, there, there's different implementations of how to actually do that proof of work but the overall goal is exactly the same. I need to find a nonce such that my block hashes down to start with four zeros. And and the different implementations are just different essentially map reduced algorithms of adding one. How do I how do I actually go about trying lots of values? Cool. So if I've got a GPU, how do I push those through? If I have a chip that's specifically very, very good at SHA two five six, how do I cool. go about that? What if I'm working in parallel with a friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a block, but again, we said we were doing blockchains. So you might have guessed we're going to link them together like a chain. Because now, if you and I had the same data and we were to create the same block, we'd come to the same nonce, which is the point. If we yes, although there but there will be different nonces that could produce the same yes that could produce a valid a valid hash. Yes. yes, depending on where you start. Which is what would example. make it different theoretically. Yeah. Okay, so we want to link these blocks together in a chain, and we're going to do that by adding in an extra piece of data. We're going to include the hash of the previous block. Okay, I'll come back to that. I'll show you. This is easier to just to just show. So 
when a block gets created, I now want it to point at a previous block. So we have this index, blocks will be added linearly, and I want, I want to reference that block that was there before me. Let's add on that previous block. So this back to zero. And I'm going to include that when I hash myself as well. Actually, let's not put that. The issue here becomes what about the first block? It can't, it has nothing to uh, reference. So, and uh, this is a very simplistic hack for PyDef. This is not how. It really works. Previous hash equals it genesis hash. There we go. So I'm checking, am I the first block effectively in this blockchain? And if I am, then I'm just using some dummy, a dummy string for the previous hash. Otherwise, I'm going and I'm hashing that previous block. I want to find out what is the hash of the block that came before me. And I then add that into here. So. Okay, so let's change our example now. First block, and it doesn't have, we can't point it at anything. So what did I say, Genesis? Okay. Ooh. Print example block. What did I do? The previous hash again, you haven't got to be the self dot previous. Oh no, you don't need the self dot previous hash. On your return line, yeah. your last argument of the quick hash yeah. should well just done. be previous hash. Yeah, thank you. Lovely, okay. So that worked as we expected to. Nothing's really changed for the first block. Let's make a new block. Let's call it second block. We have an index of one. Some data that, again, we don't care about for now. And it's going to point back to example block. Print second block. OK. Not valid yet, because we haven't mined it. So let's mine second block. Fantastic. Okay, so we've now got two blocks and they're linked together because second block with index one references the hash of the first block. And when I'm going to demonstrate that to you. When you say reference, you mean it's got it in it? It's got it in it, yeah. I include it when I when I hash myself down. So if I But it doesn't point at it because that's the point that you can't point from the hash to it. So it has sorry, if I it has a it has a reference, and again this varies between network that and reference. network okay, sorry, how they yeah. actually yeah. how they actually do that that pointing back back. So I'm yeah. pointing back to the previous block, sorry. and I use the hash of the previous yeah. block in my own in within own my hand. own hash. Yeah. So let's edit that first block. So example block uh, dot data. So this is someone changing the ledger. Yeah, look, a malicious a malicious attack. We're changing the data to a malicious attack, and we print example block. Not valid as we expected. Let's check second block. 
also not valid. Why? So our first block, the data changed. That means the hash changed. We include the hash of the previous block in this block, which means the hash for this block will also change. So if I want these blocks to be valid, I now have to mine both of them. So we can say example block dot mine and then print the example block. Check the second block, should, nothing should have changed. Cool. First block is now valid. Second block still isn't because that hash is not the same as it was before. Even though it starts with four zeros, it's still not the same. So the hash of my current block has also changed. So now I've got a and, and checking this is cheap because by definition a hash function is cheap. Checking this is super cheap, super super cheap yes. because hash functions are super quick, super deterministic, really really easy to do. Cool. Um, but you can see that these take a little bit of time. For and if, mine. Yeah, and I, I mean I could I could turn it up to five zeros, and it's not. It's not unreasonable, like it runs fine, it'll be about 10 seconds I think it was. The issue is that if you run into one that happens to take a while, yeah. it can take, take a couple of minutes, which isn't what we want here. So now I go back, I mine the second block, and everything is valid. Fantastic. So let's make a, let's make a longer blockchain, so we can really see this actually happening. So you, you can change the ledger in previous transactions, as long as you go back and mine them again? Yes. And we'll get on to why that means that you can't right, go okay. back and, and change them. Um, so you can't, can't change it without it, people knowing? Effectively, yeah. yes. It's glaringly obvious yeah. when you do change it. So let's make a blockchain. And this, this, is, this is the magic, this is the blockchain, right? It's a list of blocks. Um, so that's my first block, and then we'll say for i in range. Let's do maybe eight, I think that should work. Block, block. So we'll set the index to i, fine. Add some, some data. Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm typing that up. <laughs> and then the previous block would just be um, underscore. Thank you. Would just be the end block of the blockchain. And we're going to mine those as we add them. Add them to the blockchain, block chain dot append. Should it be new block dot mine? New yep, absolutely, thank you. New block dot mine. So I'm creating this block based on some artificial data and the last block of the blockchain. I then mine it to make sure it's valid, and at that point I can add it to the blockchain. And we'll just print that for our sake. Okay. Okay. That's good. I'm glad that happened. So I want, as you said, some of them come in really quickly, some of them take a lot longer, and there's no way of knowing when that's gonna, when that's gonna happen. So that one that took a while, we had to try 200,000 values. The one before it, we only had to try 14,000 values. And again, if I now go back in, and I say, okay, let's get the second So we're going to take the second block and we're going to change its data to um, hack attack <laughs> because it rhymes. Uh, <laughs> and now we'll have a look for block in blockchain. Print block. So we change. This is the this is where the attack occurred. Hash is invalid. And because of those hashes are then included, we get this ripple effect where everything after that is now considered invalid. 
So in order for that attack to be considered valid, I then have to mine that block, but all of the other blocks would still be invalid. So I'd have to mine all of those as well afterwards. And again, and that's going to take time or proof of work, as we were saying before, for block in blockchain. And one of them took a while again. Interestingly, the um, same one, but that's that's coincidence. That's coincidence, right? yeah. yeah. And then and then the last one took quite a while yeah. as well that time. And now they're all valid. But this has taken time. It's taken CPU power to make sure that everything is valid. Um, okay, but so what? Effectively, <laughs> right? I mean, this is all uh, cool. This. <laughs> So we've shown what happens if an attacker attempts to edit some previous data, but you know, so what? What does this? What does this actually mean? Let's, so let's go through the process of what happens in Bitcoin. So the first step is that a user creates an addition to the ledger. I want to make this transaction, and this is broadcast to the network. Um, and so everyone can, everyone in the network can see that this this transaction is waiting to happen. In Bitcoin, they will then package several transactions together as a block. So that data where I was just putting random stuff in, that would be transactions. And these would be packaged together and um, we'd then do the proof of work to find a nonce such that everything hashed down to have those four zeros. At which point that new block would then be broadcast to the entire network. So everyone in the network would go, ah, yes, okay, that block is good, all those transactions are ones that were just sitting there waiting, it hashes down correctly, um, and that's then considered added to the blockchain, and the process starts again. We look at those pending transactions, we package them together, and find the nonce and add the valid block to the blockchain. How does the broadcasting happen? As in like, it's decentralized, right? Mm -hmm. But so, so it's like a peer-to-peer, -peer, you decide I'm now bro gonna broadcast and everyone receives by the, the network or? The actual mechanism of how one node talks to another in yeah. the network, I don't. But there's no I central, there's, but nothing there's nothing central. central. You're not sent, you're, you it's are just sending. nodes talking to each other saying, I can see that these transactions are waiting. I've packaged these ones up and I found an appropriate nonce. I'm going to send it out. And as soon as another node sees one come in, they'll go, they'll drop what they're doing and say, yeah, okay, good, that's valid. And we move on. Okay. The why, why would they drop what they're doing and move on? <gasps> nodes in the network use the longest blockchain available, always. Okay. So that's, that's defined in the network settings effectively. Um, so I'm looking at my own blockchain, like this, and then my mate over there sends me a valid block full of transactions that hashes down appropriately, references things correctly. So my blockchain is now one longer. So I ignore what I was doing before and I move up and I start again. Does that make sense to people? We always use the longest blockchain that we can see, whether we created that next block or someone else did. So if you make a transaction mm -hmm. using a Bitcoin payment, mm -hmm. does that mean that it then sort of goes into a queue for someone to solve whatever the nonce is before that payment gets valid? Yes. So is it in the case of like first come, first serve and who gets solved? So, so you could be unlucky in the fact that it's like, oh my God, Bitcoin's so high, I want to sell it. And yours is just unlucky and it's really difficult. To so um, miners choose. So the pending transactions sit in a pool and miners choose. So one thing I haven't talked about here is that there are fees. It is not free to send a Bitcoin transaction. You'll associate a tiny little fee with your transaction that um, the miner receives if they manage to package that transaction into a valid block. 
So if I'm a miner, I'm going to look at all of the transactions that are waiting and go, okay, that one's got a high fee, that one's got a high fee, that one's got a high fee. I'm going to package those into a block. I then do the proof of work to find the appropriate nonce and those little fees all come to me. Who sets the fee? The user. So it would be so like, I'm, if I'm I really have impatient. a super urgent transaction, it has to be in the next block I've got a huge fee on. If I have a transaction that I do not care about when it arrives, then I don't even give it a fee. And I just wait until a miner says, yeah, I've got space in my block. So there is a, there is a size limit on the block. You can't just add in as many transactions as you like. It sounds a lot like post, with postage stamps, saying you should send my letter off quickly, rather than slowly. Oh, as in like first class and yeah. second class. Yeah, except you have a, I mean, Continuous. you've got much finer yeah. granularity on the fee that you're, you're offering. Are um, higher fees harder to solve or not? No, but some transactions are harder to solve. So the ledger that I showed before was very simplistic. It was from Alice to Bob. But uh, you can imagine, say for an exchange, where they've got lots and lots of users, if people make, are making, if a thousand people make a withdrawal, it's more efficient for them to instead of doing a thousand transactions, they do one transaction that has one thousand outputs. Um, that's a harder problem to solve. Okay. Uh, so the fee with that will be higher. Um, why would that be harder? Why would it be harder to solve? Because you're just squishing all the data into half. It's anyway. not necessarily it's harder to solve, it's that it takes more room in the block. But it's still more efficient than doing a thousand individual okay. transactions. Okay. So a miner is going to say, okay, yeah, I will do that, but it takes more room in the block, so I can't have other transactions that would be paying a fee, effectively. Oh, because the actual <coughs> blockchain, I keep on, for some reason, I keep on thinking of just the hashes as the blocks, but they're not. They're all the data associated with the hashes as well. Yeah, sorry. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what's next? So let's have a look at that as if there was a malicious node. So this is our good blockchain in blue coming along. So this is how is it, it's resistant to attack. Why do we care about that proof of work that we've been talking about? Someone malicious comes along and edits block two. So, so something would be like saying... Sorry, like, no, they edit block three. So this would be someone who actually goes, <coughs> James gave me 5,000 pounds. Exactly, I see a yeah. transaction Maybe I spent some money and now I'm going to go back and I want to delete the fact that I spent that money. Right. Um, and so I edit that transaction. Immediately the block and all the ones after it are invalid because their hashes have been changed. They don't start with four zeros. Everything's invalid. And so now this edited chain is several blocks shorter because everything after it is invalid. So all the good nodes in the network continue to use the longest chain that they longest valid chain that they can see. So they continue working on this chain. I now, as the malicious attacker, have to redo that proof of work. So I have to calculate the nonce of block three, the one that I edited, and I then have to calculate the nonce of block four and calculate the nonce of block five. Okay, I've caught up with the network, except that we've said this takes time. This takes computing power, and the rest of the network has way more computing power than I do, so they've added on another four blocks in that time, and that's still the longest valid uh, blockchain that nodes can see, so that's the one that they use. I've got to do more catching up, and I can never catch up. <coughs> the network is secure, provided that no single malicious attacker controls more than half the hashing power. As soon as good nodes control more than half the hashing power, I cannot catch up. Um, What's to stop me trying to slip one in? So say I paid you five grand and it's like, oh no, actually I want that five grand back. Mm -hmm. what's, what's to stop me sitting with a block and just constantly trying to add it onto the network? And so like, well, here's the longest chain, I'll start. And I'll keep trying and doing that proof of work until that block is then valid and then go, ooh, add it to the chain. So, so are you saying you've already spent 
five thousand yeah. or yeah so say, say that i wanted to insert a malicious node but rather than trying to redo the entire network i just have that one malicious block that i want to insert and i just keep trying to tack it onto the end because eventually i'm going to get lucky and i'm going to get a hash so you're going to try and add a refund block yeah and just, and just so what's to stop you spending other people's funds or to stop you just no, adding so in a random so, so what's to stop me adding in a random block on the end the chances because you have to reference that previous block's hash. So you can only start hashing this block that you're trying to sneak in once that one's been added. Because the blockchain's not just the hashes. Mm. So you're looking at the blockchain, I'm trying to sneak one in, so I have to I now have to hash this block before anyone else. The chances of that are phenomenally small. That's so your thing with you to try to add the one block onto it, but the rest of the world is wanting to add it on. There's no way you're going to complete finding that nonce before that chain gets extended, and that's why everything drops at that point and stuff. And so at, at that point, you're, effect, you're, sti you're actually a good node. All you're trying to do is add a block to the network, and as long as the transactions in it are valid and it hashes down to zero, then that's fine. Well, I'll see. I don't, cause I, I don't, what's malicious about what you're trying to do? You're saying you're trying to sneak so, so in a I, block. Okay, I'm trying to take the money I gave you back off you. So you're trying to spend someone else's money? Yeah. yeah okay, so. yeah, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Okay. Okay, good. I'm glad All right, we got our heads. Yeah, okay. okay. So if you're just sneaking in a block, you're effectively just part of the network providing security. As long as the transactions are valid and it hashes down correctly and it references correctly, it's a good block, the network says thumbs up, let's move on. But as regards to spending other people's money, um, we will, I'll talk about that in a minute. Is, is this still blockchain versus Bitcoin? We're not quite at Bitcoin yet, is that? Effectively, yes, yes. Um, Just one small thing. Absolutely. The one you did before, whenever you, whenever you sort of threw a spanner in the works in an earlier block, mm -hmm. it destroyed it and then it was gone. Mm -hmm. say in this one, there's always a record that you didn't do. What, what do you mean by so, destroyed it? So, so do you remember when you had your, your chain of blocks? Yes. And then when you threw it, when you had a malicious attack, mm -hmm. it just wrecked everything, and then you had to go back and mine it again. Yes. But there was no sort of reference to, you, you couldn't just sort of say, okay, we'll thin, thin those malicious attack blocks, we'll go back to the original blocks. So in my example, yeah, yeah you, okay. you can't, so but a, this would be ledger. replicated on other people's System, so, so there would always be someone who has a full record of the good blockchain. So that's always recoverable. Yes. Because okay, so in your particular example, on your particular computer, you had more than half the hashing power because you had all. I the had hashing. all the hashing you power. power yes. Hashing. <laughs> yeah. But as soon as if we'd done this, and there are some there's some good blog posts around, which is what I would have liked to do, but it was a lot of boilerplate code where they effectively build this and then put a nice flask wrapper on it so that we can open up an API and if people have got a laptop in the room, you can start trying to interact oh, cool. with, with the blockchain live. But it's a, lot of, um, it's a lot of boilerplate to go through, so I thought I'd, and people have done better things as well, so I thought I'd just use what they've done instead of coding it live. Okay, so as you say, let's tell me more about Bitcoin, because this is not a valid method of payment so far. There are issues, as Alex has, pointed out, which is good. I'm glad you've spotted them. Um, first of all, the incentive for good nodes. We've touched upon that in that there are fees associated. We've slightly touched that. At no point have we talked about where does a Bitcoin come from. So that ledger I showed at the, be at the beginning had Alice pays Bob, Bob pays Tesco, Aldi pays Alice. But where did the initial transaction come from? How does where does, it, where does it start? Um, and then finally, proof of ownership. So we're going to fix the first two in, with one swoop. Um, every block in true, includes a transaction that has no sender, only a recipient. So this is again defined by the network. So it doesn't have... Uh, uh, sorry, it doesn't have a sender only a recipient. Actually, uh, yes, yeah. 
Um, and the recipient is the person who finds the correct nonce. So this is where bitcoins are created effectively out of thin air. I find the correct nonce for this block and I receive, at the moment it's 12 and a half bitcoins as a reward for doing that. It doesn't come from anyone, it's just that's how it's defined by the network. It's called the block reward and this decreases over time. So there is always a reward for miners to mine a block and it's also how bitcoins are distributed into the system. They're drip fed at a constant but yet decreasing amount. So a bitcoin is not a block. No. So bitcoins is the numbers. The, the, and you got 12 pounds from little. Yes. Okay. They could be pounds, so but we're calling them. It's the data bitcoins. that's in the blocks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we'll now see all this. We will now see all this put together. So a block can, take, can contain many transactions, mm -hmm. but blocks are a fixed size or no? Yes. Right. Okay. Correct. Nope. Okay, so someone has now done pretty much everything I've just explained to you, but they've bootstrapped it, so it looks nice. So <laughs> we have a <laughs> we have a hash function, and you can see as I change this, that hash. Can you see this properly? I'll make it bigger. That hash value down the bottom is changing yeah. instantaneously, and and there's no way of me predicting that. And cheaply. Yes, super super fast. Yeah. Okay, a block. As an index, a nonce, and some data. Again, we're just going to make this data arbitrary. But this would theoretically be James pays five pounds to Tesco, five Bitcoin to Tesco. Yes, yes. And we can see this hash is changing down the bottom. Yeah. And then we can mine it, and it does some work, and we get this 3516. It starts with four zeros. Brilliant. As soon as I change it, it's invalid. I have to mine it again, exactly as we've seen cool. before. Good. Cool. We can then make these reference each other. So this is my first block. It has a hash value. And then this previous 0, 0, 0, 0, 15783 is coming from 15783 here. So if I change this block, the hash value changes. So the previous hash value changes here. So everything becomes invalid. And then I have to do all this mining again. Oh my god. Just like we've done in the Jupyter notebook. Except this seems to take a while because it's written in. I can't remember what it was written in actually. We've seen this. Okay. Ooh, no, it won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> killed it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what were the chances? Is this. Oh, just. There we go. Okay. So yeah, it was a massive. 503,000, oh and that's gone back to whatever the default values were. But that was a huge 500,000 nonce. Um, okay, so someone's done the work to take this from arbitrary data to transactions. So we have a block, has an index, a nonce, and they've just put in some dummy data for us, which is all editable. If I change if I say actually I want Elizabeth to, spend, to send Jane fourteen pounds, I can change that, but it changes the hash. Block. If you know, if you go back to what it was before, yeah, okay. So if you want to do your malicious attack, it will reset it. Yes, okay. absolutely, yeah, yeah. And they nicely go from red to green, and green to red. Oop, let's undo that. And again, so make this a thousand. Everything afterwards becomes invalid. And I have to remine. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking about every block has a transaction with no sender, only a recipient. We call this a coin-based transaction, and it's how the miners are rewarded. And that looks like this. So the first ever block only had a coin-based transaction. No one could make a transaction when there was no bitcoins in the network. So 
Sorry, Coinbase. Sorry. It's called a Coinbase trans trans which, uh, transaction. Which means just magically making them. Just the name. It's just okay. the name. Okay. And yes, it's magically making them out of thin air. Um, and so they there is one of these in the origins of Bitcoin. There could be one of those. Is that there right? is one Coinbase transaction in every block. In every every block. Every block that's mined has a Coinbase transaction. Okay. Yes, I got you. Yep. And the recipient is the successful miner. It's their reward for doing that work and finding that nonce. Okay. So Anders is the person. Let me make this Amy. P at A. And is the network that says we're starting a new block now? So the miners initiate that. So whenever, whenever, so it's always good to create new blocks. So the miners are desperate to create new blocks okay. because of this Coinbase transaction, where they receive at the moment it's twelve and a half Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So they're absolutely desperate to make new blocks. Okay. Because they get rewarded for every single one that they make. More so than for adding something to a block. Then there's also a small fee for each of the transactions that they include yeah. within okay. the block. So that meant that solving a complete block when Bitcoin is the highest would have got you nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Big money. Oh, well, yeah. I've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and and the, uh, the block reward when it first started, I think, was 50 Bitcoin. So this is back when the difficulty was, you know, it had to start with pretty much four zeros. So you could just mine on your little laptop and it would have been. 50 Bitcoin reward. Obviously, at the time, People two pizzas co two pizzas cost you 10,000 Bitcoin. So, <laughs> but if you'd held on to them, you'd uh, you'd have a fair few pennies now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've covered how Bitcoins are introduced into the network and how miners are rewarded. How do we incentivize good nodes to actually do this proof of work and make sure that the network is secure. Good. Okay. And then Alex's issue, proof of ownership. Um, well, I'm making sure I haven't left out any vital pieces of information. Um, so the, the other, the good thing about the uh, Coinbase transactions is that they're predictable. We know that they're going to be 12 and a half Bitcoin <coughs> added every 10 minutes for the next two years at which point it halves again, and it keeps halving every two years, roughly. And they have decided that it's two years, the half life? Yes, they okay. being Satoshi Nakamoto when he first wrote the white paper. Um, and it'll stop. Four years. Pardon? Four years? Every four years. Is it every four years? Four okay. years. Yeah. It was one of those numbers that I've not written yeah. down. And it was rough. it was of the order years. Um, <laughs> to a maximum of 21 million, at which point they stop. 21 million? 21 million Bitcoins have been mined. Currently we're at about 17 million. And so then there'll be a constant number of Bitcoin. And so then that's just 21 million Bitcoin in the world and that's it. So when, where would the new Coinbase transactions come from? So the idea at that point is that um, by that time the network is big enough that the fees from transactions sustain the miners and they don't need so there'd be no more, no more cost they no don't more. need that extra incentive of the Coinbase cool. transaction do you um, think there's going to be another bubble on it just before they stop so they're just before we get to 21 million do you think there's going to be another like, rush to buy them generally there's an the increase price. in price before uh, it's called the, the halving when the reward halves because you're reducing the incoming supply. So cool. generally the price tends to increase around that time just due to supply and demand. You put it in your calendar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not financial advice. <laughs> you led with that, it's too late. None of this is financial advice. This is all, this is all technology. <laughs> okay, but, so Alex had a great, <laughs> issue, what stops us from spending other people's Bitcoin? What stops <laughs> me from creating a transaction 
that says, all right, Vince is going to send me all of his money. Um, and we do that through, uh, here we are, public private key pairs. So in that ledger at the beginning, um, I was said money was sent from Alice to Bob, or from Tesco to Bob, or whatever. We don't use names. Bitcoin addresses are the public key of a public private key pair. Every transaction must be signed by the private key that's paired with the sender's public key. I thought there were no senders. In the transactions. This is for a transaction, okay. not the Coinbase transaction. Okay. But for a sender, so if I send money to Vince, that transaction must be signed by my private key. And because the addresses are the public key, that means all of those signatures are really easily verified. So because I can't sign for you, I can't say James. Because you can't sign for me, you can't spend my money. So anyone can really easily verify that a transaction was signed by the sender and therefore created by the sender, um, but we can't send each other's money. So are these private keys are stored in your wallets? Private keys are stored in what's called a Bitcoin wallet, yeah, which is misleading. A wallet. <laughs> is oh, a there's something misleading. <laughs> <laughs> wallet is a ridiculous name for what they are because a wallet implies that they hold money. They don't. The money is all held on the blockchain, in the cloud, however you want to describe it. It's not held on your laptop, it's held on a blockchain. But you have the. Everyone has you, the blockchain. We don't. So you don't necessarily need a full copy of the blockchain because okay. you can just connect to a server that, has it. To the, that just has it. In the same way, you don't need Wikipedia downloaded on your laptop. Um, a really good way of thinking of them that I saw in a YouTube video, a wallet is more of a key ring. Mm. It's a really, use, really easy way of holding the, your private keys and it makes it easy to sign transactions and unlock things. Some wallets can hold keys from different cryptocurrencies. Some wallets can only hold Bitcoin keys or Ethereum keys. Um, so these keys are the most important part for a user. If someone else gets hold of your private key, they can sign transactions from you and steal your funds. But if you write down your private key on a piece of paper and put it in a safe, and that's the only place that, that private key exists, then no one is going to steal it unless they break into that safe. If you memorize it, no one can steal it, but then you might forget it. And if you forget it, the funds are lost forever. There is no way to spend them because you have to have the private key to sign the transaction. So if you lose your private key, the funds are lost forever. They are just stuck on the blockchain. And there's supposedly quite a large amount of Bitcoin. Supposedly, yeah. yeah. Uh, people who have thrown away hard drives that had the private key to 50,000 Bitcoin or something insane like that, I can't remember. That story. The he went actually climbing through um, <coughs> the land through landfills to try and find his, his hard drive. Yeah. It, it's just, so don't, is the, uh, don't lose it. Oh. <laughs> um, so we can see, we can then add that in. So we can generate random private keys, they have an associated public key. We can then, we've got a message, hello, we can then sign using our private key and we get a signature out of that, which we can then verify. And if that message changes, the signature is no longer valid. I'd have to re-sign it with, I'd have to re-sign this, get the new signature, we can see the signature changed and it automatically copies that in for me, how handy, and everything's fantastic and so we can then sign all the transactions and if the amount changes we can sign transactions and then if the amount changes we get different signatures and we can verify these and again if the amount changes this is no longer valid so eventually the blockchain looks like this which is now getting a bit much we have this original coinbase transaction there are now funds in the network and again, this is a toy demonstrate example. It's not all technically correct. 
So if I now change this, the uh, oh, let's not change that. Or well, for example, if you were to change it so that the that's the public key, right? So if you were to put your public key and say actually that those hundred dollars came to me. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if I change this, for example, yeah, yeah. put in your public key, right? Or yeah, which is I've um, I've uh, emailed the guy who who uh, sorry who I'm almost done who uh, created this. So created this. So he's he's got some of it working. If I change if I change the amount, obviously the data changes, so the hash becomes invalid, and then we can see that the signature is invalid here. It's gone red. Um, but what he's not done is the important bit, where, where if I change <laughs> who it's going to, um, that's not turned right. So I've emailed him. I've not heard that. But even then, right, the whole hash. But the whole hash would still change. This is more about what yeah. if I, uh, as Alex said, what if I created a transaction that honestly had nothing to do with me? I was spending other people's money just, just to mess with them. Yeah. Why, how, why can I not do that? So we do this by these signatures. So if I change that transaction, I then have to, my signature would be incorrect. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So finally, and that's all you need really for a fairly functioning uh, blockchain like Bitcoin. Yes. So the signature goes into being another bit of the data which changes the hash. Yeah. Like if the, the signature changes, that's also hashed down. There's all kinds of things that get hashed down into the block that aren't just what I've said. I'd strongly, strongly recommend, if you're at all interested, going and reading Satoshi Nakamoto's original white paper. It's, it's really accessible. Um, goes into, obviously, quite a lot of detail. Um, there's tons and tons of stuff online. They go into way more detail than, than I have here. Um, and then, if you still want to know more, so I've added a ton of references at the end here for people who want to do more research. So myths, so there's a lot of myths surrounding Bitcoin. So for example, the fact that it's anonymous, it's kind of pseudo anonymous. So we can look at the blockchain and we can see, we can follow funds. Alice sent money to Bob, Bob then sent money here. So we can see those transactions happening. We can follow the paper trail. We just don't necessarily know because they're just public keys. We don't necessarily know who owns those public keys except that the only real places to buy Bitcoin is on exchanges where you have to have an account, at which point there is a link between a credit card and a transaction on the blockchain and you can follow the money through. Um, so the, why do the authorities say if ransom money paid in Bitcoin, is it untraceable? It's not at all. So there are websites dedicated to um, so there was a couple of big hacks a couple of years ago for an exchange called Mt. Gox. They stole, stole a huge number of funds. And there are people who have set up websites that just look at where those funds are. So we can see those funds were stolen somewhat. They managed to get hold of the private key and create a transaction and sent it to a new address that they then owned and had full control of. But we can see what address that was and we can then watch it. And as soon as any transactions are made from that address, we can just follow them through. And um, with those funds, they generally just sat there. So with the authorities saying um, it's completely anon anonymous, it, it's just completely wrong for Bitcoin. There are cryptocurrencies that are anonymous um, that I have, do not yet understand how they work because they somehow hide the sender, receiver, and amount of the transaction. So I don't really see how you can have a functioning blockchain from that, but they do. But Bitcoin, certainly not. Bitcoin is very, very open and not anonymous at all. Um, the environmental impact of Bitcoin, I get a lot of questions on this. The fact that, is it Poland, Poland that it now uses more electricity than? Um, mm. So I take these with a pinch of salt. Yes, it does use more electricity than, than Poland, probably, but it's hard to estimate. Um, the reason for that is we can make reasonable estimates of the hash rate of the network. We know how many nonce values are being tried per second. That's fairly, we can estimate that fairly accurately. What we don't know is what hardware they're being run on. So if we're trying a million nonce values a second, that takes a massively different amount of energy depending on whether it's being run on a smartphone or 
a GPU or a specifically designed chip, and we don't know those things. So it's tough to estimate the energy, and also it's hard to compare it with things. So for a comparison, Bitcoin network uses less than a third of the electricity the US uses on Christmas lights. But we want to relate that to the modern banking system, and that's almost impossible to do. Um, we, can we can compare it with the production of gold. It's massively less than electricity used on mining gold. It's massively less than the electricity used for turning gold into minted bullion. Uh, what we can't estimate is how much electricity is used in banks and in bank branches and things like that. There's, it's very difficult to compare it with something. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to guess that thousands and thousands of branches, physical locations being open, are using a lot more electricity than this. Or is what the estimates show, but it's really difficult to do, really difficult. Is the counterpoint to that not though, from my perception, mm -hmm. being completely outside of it and only now actually understanding a bit of it thanks to your talk, that it doesn't feel like it's really used? Bitcoin. I mean, like, apart from in a certain, uh, compared to, for example, gold. Yes and no. Well, yeah. I mean, gold, sure to do that. gold is not used as a currency. Okay. You don't go, you can't go to Tesco <laughs> with your bag of shots on and gold. just, <laughs> yeah, with a cheese grater and a bar of gold and just. Okay. Okay. And it's it's not used that much here. And the thing is, in highly developed third world countries, third highly developed first world <laughs> Western cultures is not where it's going to have a big impact at the beginning. It's in places like Venezuela and Zimbabwe where they have huge rates of inflation that this just completely cuts out. Where there's no central government issuing a currency, it's just maths. If you have five Bitcoin on the blockchain, then you have five Bitcoin on the blockchain. And okay. the government isn't going to come along and print another five billion so you're that makes that what you have worth. Is this actually happening though? Is it popular in uh, yes, countries? Especially in Zimbabwe. So I gave a talk in September time. And at the time at the time Zimbabwe was having a particularly bad period of inflation. Um, to the extent where Bitcoin was actually trading at a 50% premium within Zimbabwe because so many people were desperately converting their Zimbabwean dollars into Bitcoin because they knew that it would hold its value no matter what happened with their currency. How come was it a 50% premium before this is completely just because of the exchanges, the infrastructure oh, right. isn't yet there. So right. okay. there's only one Zimbabwean exchange right. and so and so demand on there skyrocketed if you had a Zimbabwean bank account and a, an American uh, Euro, European bank account you can make a really tidy sum just arbitraging through that the only bottleneck was moving funds between Zimbabwe and uh, an American bank account but it's but especially and Venezuela is exactly the same so Venezuela actually are in the process of releasing their own cryptocurrency to try and deal with the hyperinflation. Because the old prices crashed, I think, and their entire economy was July ago. A absolutely. Oh. But in a, in a way, it's kind of backwards because a government issued cryptocurrency isn't decentralized. They can still print loads more because they run the network. So it's, it's pretty backwards. But again, Bitcoin is becoming very, very popular in places like Venezuela because of these inflation issues. And that's where we're going to see it come through first, in my opinion. I spoke to five Zimbabweans a couple of months back. And mm. I remember chatting about Bitcoin still in the way I was before this talk. I really enjoyed where I'm now a Bitcoin expert. Um, <laughs> but uh, none of them were using it again. Fair enough. I, I, might, might I mean, be five, this is still, I mean, it's still really, really, really early days. Okay. Really early days. But uh, then, doesn't that kind of counteract the point that it's already using X amount of electricity? Mm -hmm. And that if it's just early days, it's only going to get worse? No, so not necessarily. So okay. 
the amount of electricity used is not proportional to the number of transactions. It's proportional to the hash rate. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, it's, uh, it's proportional to the hash rate. To the hash rate. Um, so if there, if there are no transactions and a massive, massive hash rate, those blocks still get created, that electricity still gets used. If there are thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions going through, and actually only a few people mining the blocks, there's only a small hash rate and only a small amount of electricity. Now obviously the caveat to that is that the more popular Bitcoin gets, the more, prof the more profitable mining might become, so more people get into it. Um, but there are lots of solutions to this being proposed. So the, um, what, the original white paper was written in 2008. This is young technology. Uh, there are a lot of proposals for how do we make Bitcoin more efficient? How do we make it handle the millions of payments that we want it to be able to do in the future? Um, so that's SegWit and Lightning Network. SegWit is short for Segregated Witness. So you move out that, uh, those signatures. We can move those and basically rearrange the block a little bit and make it more data efficient, which means we can fit more trans would be slightly cheaper. We can fit more transactions in, okay. and so the network becomes more efficient and we're using less electricity for the transactions. Lightning Network is a secondary layer on top of Bitcoin, um, which would allow us to near fearless instantaneous transactions. Um, would massively improve the network, but that's really, really, it's only gone live on the main net within the last couple of months, within 2018, I believe. Do I have anything? Yes, and then the future of blockchain. So that was Bitcoin specific stuff. So we have things like proof of stake instead of proof of work, which is where consensus comes from having a stake in the system. Um, mm -hmm and again, is designed to be more efficient than proof of work overall. Smart contracts, which allow us to store code on the blockchain and is then executed by the network. So I can write a little script, um, it's stored on the blockchain in that data and when certain conditions are hit, defined by the smart contract, it then executes and it sends money around or it texts me or whatever. And I don't have to worry about that. It's the code is then executed by the miner who was finding that nonce. They then execute all of the, the smart contract code as well. Uh, DAG currencies, which take blockchain, so that linear blockchain that we had so that picture of, and they convert them into a directed acyclic graph. So instead of just referencing one block, I'm referencing a couple of them. Uh, which allows us, gives massive speed ups. They're really, again, that's really, really new technology. Why does that speed things up? Um, just because the way you can do the, um, you effectively get more, but, so by mining this block, I'm then confirming that block. And if I spread this out as ah, a tree, I'm, I'm, I'm effectively confirm, getting more confirmations okay. for my money is a way to think about it. And then hash graph, which takes that a step further so I just threw these on here as a if you're at all interested these are the things to go away and read as the future of blockchain blockchain 3.0 they call it and I think that's everything I have yes any questions <laughs> <laughs> you've had quite a few questions as we've gone but does anyone have uh, further questions for yes yeah how does the network come to an agreement like say I mine a block mm -hmm. and Vince mines a block and they both like they both happen at the same time yeah. yes so um, we always use the longest block we can see and so for for every node in the system one of those it's going to see one of those blocks first so it will use that block you will use that blockchain the one that it sees first so now you've, you've split your hash power effectively. But is that guaranteed across blocks that all blocks would see the same one first? No. So you're effectively splitting your, your hash rate. Half your network is going to use Vince's ah. chain. Half the network is going to use Alex's chain. But one of those will then Finish. mine another one, at which point this will now be a block ahead of this. And they'll go, oh, right, we drop everything we've done. 
and we go and use this longest chain. I don't think it's actually happened on the network at any point, um, but it, it definitely could. Probability says that it will, it will um, but it's, it's effectively, it's fine, because the chances of it happening twice in a row, three times in a row, get dim, you know, tend to infinity very, very quickly, and we just use the longest one as soon as that happens. Even if we ended up splitting and going three blocks, a, a fork that was three blocks deep, mm -hmm. eventually one of them will get longer than the other one with enough time for everybody to switch over onto this longest chain. The issue is that all of these blocks that this change mine, chain mined, whilst technically valid, they were not malicious in any way, they are then they are orphaned, and all of those transactions go back into the memory pool and, and wait mined. to be added on again. Cool. Does that mean you wouldn't get your money if you were involved in that chain? Exactly, yes. You'd have to wait for it to go back onto the other one. But the chances of it are they're re it's really, really slim. Really slim. Yeah, go. So if, if I wanted to buy pizza yes. with blockchain, uh -huh. would I need to add um, a higher fee to it, offer a higher fee to it if I wanted my pizza today? So you'd, you'd check. So there are lots of services around yeah. for what's the fee if I want this transaction in the next block, in the next six blocks, in the next a thousand blocks. And At the moment, the fees are really, really low. Okay. And you can get away with a very, very, very small fee and get into the next block. And over time, if I did more blockchain, I would understand that the next block means today. 10 next. minutes for right. Bitcoin. Oh yes, you said that, yes, yeah. Okay. But that varies between um, the cryptocurrency you'd be using. So yeah. Litecoin, which is a fork of Bitcoin, has a block time of two minutes, I think. And that just varies between which protocol you need. Yeah. And uh, when you're like doing transactions, there is like a suggested fee for you already, yeah. so you don't necessarily need, need to, to think to about it. There's yeah. a, there is a dumb kind <laughs> yeah. of yeah. Okay. And so and um, so one thing that also happens is that uh, we've talked about confirmations, which is how deep a block is. So you buy your pizza, it gets confirmed within a block. It's in the blockchain. Yeah and then more blocks get added, say four more blocks get added, you've then effectively got four confirmations from these extra blocks. Okay. Um, and we tend to say that after six, you're, you're done. There's no, there's no way that could possibly be a false transaction now. There's no way this could be malicious. So the pizzeria could say, we're gonna wait for six transactions yeah, to happen. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're gonna wait for six confirmations of this transaction just in case, because this is a, for a really large sum of money. Yeah. Likewise, some places will say zero confirmations. So they will, um, they'll see your transaction go up into that memory pool where it's floating around, waiting to be included in a block, and they can see that that's happened. So they know that you've submitted that transaction and they'll say, yeah, that's actually good enough for us. We, we trust you and we believe it will be added into a block and Perhaps something like time. a pizza. They would, yeah, they would, ex exactly, yeah. exactly. At what, point, sorry, at what point in the process does something check that you've got the money that you want to transfer? So both miners and then just uh, full nodes. So the miners will check that though the transactions it's including in its block are valid. So it will do that work. And then also anyone can go and run a full node which doesn't do any mining at all it just checks blocks it just picks blocks that are coming in through the network and so goes, goes through, through the ledger and just goes through and says is this correct do these hash values make sense uh, and it, they're, they're dead easy to set up no mining it just sits there and checks the network but the miners are the main people who check that transactions are valid that you have the funds you say you have You say the difficulty scales to accommodate the you know capacity of the network. Mm -hmm. So then that means the criteria to determine if a block is valid or not changes. Yes. So how does the network agree what the criteria is at this point in time? Um, how does the network agree what the um, so that's that's done in the background. So there is 
that it used to be static and they literally had to change the code to say, okay, this is the difficulty now in the very early days. And that's now dynamically done. The network automatically adjusts itself depending on the hash rate that it can see incoming, generally. It's just, it's just built in. The, the code that runs the mining is also checking the hash rate. And then again, so what's to stop me on my computer setting the difficulty really low and generating a stream of like 20 valid blocks and then like, you know, pinging them off into the network one by one? Other nodes will look at them and say, they're not valid because their difficulty will be really low. So how do you how is there a consensus on the current difficulty level? Well, that and how how do by just looking at a hash know what the difficulty was? The number of zeros at the beginning. That's, that's literally how it works. Yeah, no, it is literally. So, <laughs> so okay. <laughs> so I can go to uh, Bitcoin Privacy dot net, um, which is a blockchain explorer. So, okay, so this is the most recent block, block five hundred and fourteen thousand. And we can see all of these transactions have a hash. And this is the block hash. And it starts with a lot of zeros instead of just four. It, so, so what we were doing is not in any way a simplification of the actual <laughs> problem. It fantastic. is just, and Bitcoin uses SHA-256. We're doing exactly what Bitcoin does. That's fantastic. It's so, just and so that number must be like encoded somewhere because like old blocks might only have three zeros at the front. The yes, and what I don't know is how you keep track of what was the difficulty for a previous for a block in cool. past history. I don't know how that's done. Because yes, you're going to go back in time and you're going to, you know, if I go back to uh, I, Genesis Bitcoin block, so we can look at the first. Maybe this will point me at it. But we can look at the very first um, block. Oh, the hash of the Genesis block was mm. this, which has still quite a lot of zeros, but not as many as this one. Mm. I don't know how we keep track of what was the difficulty for that particular, that, that at that time. That's okay. something you'd have to go and read in the white paper. In fact, it won't be in the white paper because that's changed since then. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Last one for me. Go on. When are we going to run out of hash numbers? <laughs> I, that, I don't I, know. I assume it's going to be like, you know, 50,329. I'd assume, yeah. assume it's quite a long time and changing the hash function is not difficult. Yeah, as long as the whole network agrees to to change the hash function, that's actually, that's really not a difficult um, difficult thing to do. There are cryptocurrencies who specifically do change the hash function because they don't want people to create these specialized um, chips that they can mine really quick. They just want it to be kept on CPUs and GPUs, so they will change their hash whenever. Uh, chip comes out for a particular hash function. So that's not that's not too much of an issue, hopefully. And if it is, not in our lifetime. Cool. Cool, okay. Oh Can yeah, one more. Oh, I understand recently Bitcoin forked into a new cryptocurrency, Bitcoin Cash. Yes. Why was this necessary due to with the current blockchain? So uh, whether it was necessary is a matter of opinion. Um, Bitcoin has a scaling issue. Blocks are limited in size, which means that there is a limited number of transactions that the network can carry. Um, and some people came along and said, okay, we think one way of dealing with this is to increase that block size. So at the moment it's one megabyte, let's make it eight megabytes. And that was Bitcoin Cash. They literally just forked the code on GitHub, press fork, change a one to an eight, um, and you had yourself a new cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, worth billions of pounds. Um, that was, whether it was necessary, that totally depends on whether you think that that's the right way to go about scaling. 
I personally don't because all you've done is increase the network capacity by eight, which clearly isn't enough for a global currency. You're going to need to do something that scales much bigger. Are you going to then go from eight to 32 meg? Are you going to have one gigabyte blocks, a gigabyte every 10 minutes? That seems unsustainable. But then it might be if hardware gets better. Um, it's just it's just one of those things that if you choose the technology that you think has has the best chance long term. Right, let's stop there. I'm yeah. sure that. James, any other questions? Yeah, I will be in the pub for a pint. But let's let's thank James. Okay.